and welcome back to the trial of the nurse Lucy Letby. In this video I'm going to be covering for you the closing speech given by Nicholas Johnson Casey on behalf of the prosecution. Mr Johnson turns to the case of child H. He refers to a transfer form from the Countess of Chester Hospital to Arrow Park and also of child H's deterioration and the chest drains used. The form ends, the acute episodes with desaturations and bradycardias do not seem to be directly related to the respiratory problems. Child H's mother said child H was like a completely different baby at Arrow Park. Mr Johnson says child H had respiratory distress syndrome which is not unusual for a neonatal baby. There were two events where child H desaturated which were unusual. Cross-examination of Letby said staffing levels did not contribute to the collapse of child H. Mr Johnson tells the court the baby always had one-to-one -one nursing care and the delay in issuing surfactant did not have anything to do with the collapse. Mr Johnson says for the two counts, the tube was not blocked and staff could hear air going in and out of child H's lungs. Mr Johnson tells the court, Professor Arthurs, a professor in radiology, made a significant contribution to the debate on chest drains. He said chest drains do not normally cause bradycardia or desaturations and chest drain positions are not examined in detail as they do not cause problems. He said the interpretation of a chest drain position was his area of expertise. He said in his opinion the chest drains were in the space they were supposed to be. Mr Johnson tells the jury they do not have to accept his evidence but that there is no evidence to contradict it. Mr Johnson says the first significant collapse happened on September 25th, 26th, 2015. Letby was the designated nurse in room 1 no other babies were in room one. The father's statement was read out to the court. He said he and his wife had spent time in a neonatal unit until September 25th. He said he had been there until about midnight, had come back to the house and was awoken by a call needing to go back to the hospital. He said when I got back I definitely remember Lucy being there doing the chest massaging. It was explained to us child H had collapsed. Child H was a very strange colour. I remember the mottling was running out of her skin towards her fingers. Lucy Letby's nursing notes read, 2330 bradycardia and desaturation requiring Neopuff in 100% to recover. 10 mil air aspirated from chest drain by registrar Ventress. Following poor blood gas and 100% oxygen requirement, consultant Gibbs attended the unit and inserted a third chest drain. Mr Johnson says 23.30 is the time put in by Letby. Dr Ventress recorded, quote, 23.50, several episodes of desaturation in past two hours. Mr Johnson said Letby had told her of several episodes. Where has that come from? Dr Ventress wrote, first one after gas taken, good gas. Mr Johnson says Letby wrote on an intensive care chart a desaturation of 52% at 2210 which does not appear at all in the notes. Mr Johnson says there is nothing in the observation charts to suggest there is anything wrong during this period. He says the parent has an uneventful night before he left. The doctor is given a long list of problems but there is nothing in the nursing record to what Letby told Dr Ventress. Mr Johnson says this was getting other people to record problems for a child where none existed, as was the case for child E. Child E hadn't got a problem until Lucy Letby caused a problem. Dr Ventress had recorded a second chest drain was quote almost out. Mr Johnson says moving chest drains was a very effective way of sabotaging a child, as would moving an ET tube. Mr Johnson says child H was in very very poor shape and after being in arrest for 22 minutes the father noted the mottling. Dr Gibbs ruled out all natural causes for child H. He ruled out involvement of the chest drains. Mr Johnson says the evidence of Professor Arthurs puts this all to bed anyway. For the second event for child H, Dr Matthew Neen believed it was Letby who was the designated nurse for child H on that shift when it was nurse Shelley Tomlins. Letby had messaged her colleague that night, quote, 
I've been helping Shelley, so at least still involved but haven't got the responsibility. Mr Johnson says this builds Letby's plausible deniability. He says we know Letby was supposed to be in nursery room 2, not in room 1 where child H was. Mr Johnson says it shows the state of mind of Letby that night, similar to the state of mind for when she killed child C. Mr Johnson says this was another case where a child was desaturating to life-threatening levels despite good air entry. The ET tube was checked by Shelley Tomlins and there was no blockage. Mercifully, child H was revived. An x-ray showed there was no issue with the pneumothorax. The father said child H was okay during the day, then it was shortly after he had gone to get some rest when he had a knock on the door to go to be with child H at the cotside as she had deteriorated. Mr Johnson says this was yet another opportunity for Let Be to sabotage a child. Dr Neem recalled it was Lucy Letby who briefed him on the second collapse for child H. He recalled he was more concerned by this second collapse. A further collapse occurred at 3.30am despite child H having good air entry and she was transferred to Arrow Park where she recovered quickly. Dr Evans said the pneumophoruses were not the cause of the arrests. He ruled out infection as a cause of the collapses as they were rapid and catastrophic. She was on antibiotics and a lumbar puncture proved she did not have an infection. He was at a loss to explain the collapse, but it was not one of natural causes. Dr Bowen said there were delays with the surfactant. She said she could find no clinical or mechanical cause for the collapses. She said she had never known a chest drain to cause a collapse or stresses by the baby resulting in cardiac arrest. Professor Arthur saw no problem with the chest drains. Mr Johnson says the chest drains can be ruled out as a problem. He adds there was no disease or mechanical factor and it was undoubtedly sabotage by Lucy Letby. He says both collapses happened just after Child H's parents had left, which had parallels with other cases and was a signature of Letby's work. Mr Johnson says there are four children left to go through, Child I, Child J, Child N and Child Q. He first details the case of Child I. Mr Johnson says evidence have been heard of Child I that medics do not worry about self-correcting desaturations. Mr Johnson says having failed to kill Child G and Child H, she turned her attention to Child I and was designated nurse for two of the four occasions in which she tried to kill the baby girl and also falsified notes along the way. Mr Johnson says it was important to note from the post-mortem evidence that child I did not have NEC, a gastrointestinal disease. Mr Johnson says child I's first collapse was marked with a desaturation to the 30s and had vomited on September 30th. He says the day before, Dr Lucy Beeb had reviewed child I. She remembered seeing child I from memory as the girl became unwell, was shipped out recovered and then came back. She said this was unusual for her short time at the unit. Dr Beebe had said she was shocked and frustrated by Child Eye's death as she felt there was something going on which they, the staff, were not aware of. Dr Beebe said the aim for Child Eye after the September 29th review was to continue feeding and growing the baby girl. The day rotor for September 30th had let be as designated nurse for child I and two other babies in room 3. Mr Johnson says let be did not like being in room 3. The plan was to give child I immunisations as was the case for child G. He says there was nothing wrong with child I who was receiving cares from the mother and the feed. Mr Johnson says child I produced a small stool at 10am. The 10am feeding chart is signed by Letby. The doctors were very happy with child I, Mr Johnson tells the court. Dr Beebe's note is shown to the court for September 30th. Mr Johnson says it is important to note the reason for the review. It was, quote, asked to review as reduced temperature. Mr Johnson says child I was taking full bottles, gaining weight, and Dr Beebe recorded that child I was handling well. Child I, during the examination, produced a yellow seedy stool which indicated good gut health. Dr Beebe said this was not a sign of NEC. 
Mr Johnson says child eye was not in distress and the abdomen was the same as yesterday. The plan was to monitor child eye closely and raise the cot temperature. Child eye appeared clinically well. Child eye's mother in evidence said Lucy let's be raised the issue with her about child eye's stomach. Mr Johnson says that was not the same reason let's be gave to Dr Beebe. So what exactly is going on here? Mr Johnson says no concern was expressed to medical staff about Child Eye's abdomen by Lucy Letsby. Why was Lucy Letsby expressing concern to Child Eye's mother about the abdomen? Why did Lucy Letsby not raise the issue with Dr Beeb? Mr Johnson says Letsby was gaslighting the mother by suggesting a problem with Child Eye that didn't exist until she caused that problem. Mr Johnson says everything was unremarkable for child eye until 1pm when she was asleep and fed via NGT. The mother said she had gone to meet the family in the canteen at this time. The feed chart shows a 35ml feed for child eye, which Mr Johnson says would take some time, around 15 minutes, taking until 1.15pm. He says the nursing notes are accurate as they are time stamped by the computer automatically. The note is written between 1.36 to 1.48pm. It was at most 20 minutes after the feed ended. Mr Johnson says the details of the feed and review recorded are not correct. He says the addendum of 1500 doctor's examination of child eye is a complete fabrication. A male doctor's note records examining child eye at 4.30pm. Mr Johnson asks who these doctors were who examined child eye at 3pm. He adds the 3pm note contains, quote, Child eye appeared mottled in colour with distended abdomen and more prominent veins. Mr Johnson says there is no corresponding doctor's note for this examination of mottling. Letby's note stated, full monitoring recommenced. An observation note records this was done from 3pm. Mr Johnson says Dr Beeb had advised this at 11.40. He asks why did Letby only recommence full monitoring after Child Eye's mother had left the unit. Mr Johnson says Letby is transposing events, including a note of a yellow CD stall from 11.40am to 3pm to an examination which never actually happened. Mr Johnson says it's a very calculated way of giving the impression a child had a problem when the child had no problem at all. Child Eye's mother had a routine for each day, visiting Child Eye at regular times and the father would come in from after 5pm. Mr Johnson said the time between 3 and 5pm was her window of opportunity to attack Child L. What are the chances of these things happening at precisely this point? Letby had written, quote, Mummy present when reviewed by doctors, had left unit when child eye had large vomit and transferred to nursery one. Mr Johnson says Letby had tried to give the impression a neopuff caused the inflated stomach for child eye. He says remarkably child eye improved and there were minimal aspirates. Yet another miraculous recovery, all good once Lucy Letby had left. Medical expert Dr Evans ruled out infection and said the only explanation was a dose of air administered through the NG tube. Dr Sandy Bowen agreed and the effect would have been to splint the diaphragm. She discounted the possibility of NEC. Professor Owen Arthurs said the stomach and almost all of the gut had been distended. Mr Johnson says that was from administered air. The second incident for child eye on October the 13th, 2015 at 3.20am is now being detailed by Mr Johnson. The first part of the night shift had child eye being fed normally. Mr Johnson says the second event was much more serious than the first. Before it, child eye had been in a good clinical condition. He says it was expected she was coming up for discharge from the hospital in a couple of weeks. Letby was the designated nurse for a baby in room 1. Nurse Ashley Hudson was the designated nurse for child G, child I and another baby in room 2. Ashley Hudson left room 2 to attend to another baby in room 1, assisting colleague Laura Eagles. 
she asked a colleague to monitor child I, either Caroline Oakley or Lucy Letby. Caroline Oakley had no recollection of being called. Miss Hudson said she had been in room one and some milk needed defrosting for child I's feed. When she got back, there were no adults in the room. She started to prepare the milk with her back to child I. The next thing she remembered was Lucy Letby in the doorway who pointed out that child I looked pale. She was about five or six feet away from child I. She said something along the lines of, don't you think child I looks pale? Miss Hudson said the light in room two was low and the lights were on in the corridor. Mr Johnson reminds the jury what Lucy Letby said about this in interview. Mr Johnson refers to Letby's 2019 police interview in which she said room two's light was off, there was an element of light coming from the doorway and child I was by the window. Ashley Hudson said child I had a blanket over her and a tent structure keeping her secure. She said she could not see child I due to the canopy and the lighting. Mr Johnson says Letby did not have a better view. Miss Hudson said she switched on the light and looked at child I, who was gasping, incredibly pale and in a very bad way. Miss Hudson initially thought the deterioration was so rapid she thought she was too late to save her. She said, you cannot see a child from the position Lucy Letby was in. Mr Johnson says we have a head-on credibility conflict of two accounts who don't live in the same world. Mr Johnson says in cross-examination, Letby was asked about looking from a brightly lit corridor into a dark room and would that improve her ability to see. He says her first response was, I don't know. She conceded she would not have been able to see, yet still persisted that she could see child I. We had a break, we came back and I asked Lucy what she had said in interview. He says Letby had said, maybe I spotted something Ashley couldn't spot. Mr Johnson had asked Letby, you don't have better eyesight than Ashley, do you? Letby replied, no. The question is, how would you be able to spot the colouring of child eye better than Ashley Hudson from the same point of view? Letby replied, I had more experience, so I knew what I was looking for, knew what I was looking at. Mr Johnson adds, you will remember the way she corrected herself. He says there was a very long pause and he added at the time, it's your answer, you explain it. He said Letby was finding it difficult to concentrate on all the dates. Mr Johnson said there was nothing about the dates in this context. He says did Letby make an innocent mistake or did something else slip out under the pressure of the witness box? He says Letby caused a problem for child I. He says child I recovered well. Mr Johnson says Letby had timed her note, having seen Ashley Hudson's nursing note first, so it appeared she saw child I first. Mr Johnson says it is another case of plausible deniability. Professor Arthur said child I's large bowel was distended. Dr Evans said the only explanation was air administered to child I via the NG tube. Mr Johnson says Dr Bowen explained child I was sabotaged by air administered via the NG tube or via the IV line. Dr Anne Boothroyd's x-ray report on September 30th recorded, quote, there is splinting of the diaphragm due to bowel distension. For the third event for child I, Dr Ravi Jayram said there were no clinical concerns for child I before the night of October 13th to 14th. Mr Johnson says evidence was heard to say child I was stable. This was the second time Lucy Letby was the designated nurse. Mr Johnson says this was the second time she had the opportunity to falsify notes. Dr Matthew Neem's note at 5.55am is shown to the court for October 14th. Mr Johnson says this is not a retrospectively written note as it includes a note of a prescription which is timestamped at 5.56am and an urgent x-ray which is timed at 6.05. He says Letby's addendum note made at 8.43am after child eye had desaturated said quote, at 0500 abdomen noted to be more distended and firmer in appearance with area of discoloration spreading on the right hand side, veins more prominent. 
Mr Johnson asks, why would Lucy let me do this? He says to bear in mind what happened the previous night. If these symptoms were shown, then the doctor would be called urgently. He says the absence of a doctor called shows there was no problem at 5am. Mr Johnson says from the paper trail, if anyone puts two and two together and thinks there's a problem with Lucy Letby, they are immediately thrown off the scent. Dr Neem said the mottling was unusual and that was why he recorded it. How many times have we heard that in this case? Mr Johnson says the abdomen was distended. Dr Marnarides had excluded NEC. Mr Johnson says the only possibility is pushing air in down the NG tube. Dr Neem said child eye looked uncomfortable when examined and grimaced. He noted the abdominal distension. Professor Arthur said of the x-ray image, the stomach was markedly dilated and the small bowel and the large bowel were also dilated with no symptoms of NEC. Another image at 8.03am had the stomach decompressed and the third image the following day showed no problems at all. Dr Neem recorded a further desaturation for child eye at 7am and the ET tube was reintubated. It was noted there was good air entry for child eye, but as Mr Johnson says in so many other cases for babies in this trial, child eye was desaturating. Child eye had further desaturations on October 14th to 15th, which Mr Johnson said were explicable as there were secretions in the NG tube. Child eye had a miraculous recovery after being transferred to Arrow Park and improved, until coming into the misfortune of contact with Lucy Letby. Dr Evans thought child eye stomach had been injected with air and air injected into the intravenous system. There was an astonishing amount of air in child eye stomach. Dr Bowen concluded child eye had air administered. Mr Johnson turns to the fourth and final collapse for child eye on October 22nd, 23rd, 2015 in which child eye died. Mr Johnson says Ashley Hudson had given evidence to say child eye was very easy to settle and although child eye was in nursery room one, that was as a precaution given her history of episodes. Child eye was self-ventilating in air and her saturations optimal and she looked very well, pink, well perfused and a soft non-distended abdomen. Caroline Oakley said in a statement, child eye's abdomen was fine and soft, non-distended. Mr Johnson says that is the background to child eye when Lucy Letby came on shift that night. Lucy Letby was designated nurse for a baby in room 2 and a baby in room 3. Ashley Hudson was designated nurse for child eye and another baby. Child eye was in a virtually perfect clinical scenario, Mr Johnson tells the court. He says Letby got herself involved. Child eye gave a cry that had not been heard before, loud and relentless according to Ashley Hudson, who interpreted it as distress. When she was repositioned on her tummy at about midnight, child eye stopped breathing. Resuscitation efforts began and child eye then began to fight the ventilator. Dr John Gibbs was told of the child's abnormal cry. He said he was perplexed at child eye's rapid deterioration and recovery, which would not show a sign of infection. Mr Johnson says let be falsified paperwork for one of her designated babies at this time, the baby to be transferred to Stoke. Let be recorded a note at 10.50 to 10.52pm. Note of a 10% glucose infusion for Stoke baby. The infusion note is written as starting at 2300 and that writing is changed to 2400. Mr Johnson says it was changed to give Letby an alibi for midnight. Ashley Hudson said she was alerted to child eye at 1.06am by either the alarm going off or child eye crying. She said in room 1, Letby was already there at child eye's cot side and had her hands in the incubator. Mr Johnson says Letby had sabotaged child eye and caused child eye to cry. Mr Johnson says Letby put Ashley Hudson off by saying she just needs to settle. Air++ was aspirated from child eye. Mr Johnson asks how that could have got there 
other than being forced in by Lucy Letby. Dr Rachel Chan could see air entry and chest movement on child I, but child I wasn't recovering. She said child I's death was inexplicable. Dr John Gibbs noted mottling on child I. He said he could not understand why child I had died and referred the case to the coroner. The grieving parents agreed to bathe child I. Mr Johnson said despite having two designated babies to care for and child I not being her designated baby, let be met the parents. The mother said Lucy came back in. She was smiling and kept going on about how she was present at child I's first bath and how much child I had loved it. I wish she had just stopped talking. Eventually I think she realised and stopped. It wasn't what we wanted to hear. Dr Evans says this was another case in child I receiving air administered. He thought the case of the collapse, the crying, the prolonged resuscitation, the purple and white discoloration were all symptoms of air embolus. There was no account of natural disease. Dr Bowen said the cause of death was air embolus from the unexpected catastrophic collapse, child eye being unsettled and agitated, the extremely unusual crying meaning child eye was in excruciating pain. In cross-examination, Dr Bowen was asked if she had a coherent explanation for an air embolus. Mr Johnson said Dr Bowen's answer, without hesitation, lasted for about 10 minutes. She was asked about child eye's poor weight gain, and Dr Bowen said that did not make her more likely to have a cardiac arrest. Professor Arthur said it was unusual to see that amount of dilation in child eye's stomach. He excluded CPAP belly as a cause. He said it was reasonable to infer air administered. Dr Marna Reedes said at the time of child eye's death, she had no acute illnesses or abnormalities in the bowel, other than the presence of air. The presence of gas had no pathological cause. He said the collapses were air administered from the NG tube. Mr Johnson says Child Eye's case is a stark one. He says Letby made repeated efforts to kill Child Eye and falsified notes for both Child Eye and another baby. She gave herself away in the event with Ashley Hudson. Lucy Letby's behaviour in the aftermath of Child Eye's death was bizarre and inappropriate. She revelled in what she had done. Her voyeuristic tendencies caused her to look up Child Eye's mother on Facebook. Having killed her, she wrote a condolence card. It was still on her phone when it was seized by the police.